Hello, my name is Rupinder Sial and welcome to Spartan Tutorials. Today we are going to talk about circular dichroism spectroscopy, which is a technique which can be used to investigate the secondary structure of proteins. Recently, many techniques have been developed to investigate the actual three-dimensional structure, but if we want to understand what goes on during the protein folding or protein denaturation, circular dichroism spectroscopy is a very useful method. Even before we carry out detailed X-ray crystallography of proteins, CD spectroscopy can give us very good preliminary information about that protein. So let's get into circular dichroism spectroscopy and see what is it about. Now the phenomenon of circular dichroism derives from the French word cordierite which was one of the first minerals which exhibited circular dichroism. Now the circular dichroism phenomenon derives from the linearly polarized as well as circularly polarized light. Now to understand this let's refresh our basics of the electromagnetic radiation especially light which is the main example of electromagnetic radiation it has two vectors the e and m vectors which are the electric and magnetic vectors and these are usually perpendicular to each other and the normal light as for example the light which is shining here in this room or any other light not from a normal light source usually it is not polarized the vectors are basically positioned in all directions so it is not polarized at all. So the electric and magnetic fields are vibrating in the total possible three-dimensional 360 degree fashion. Now we can create polarized light by passing it through special lenses which can create polarized light which vibrate in only one direction and this is usually called linearly polarized light. Now here you can see for example a linear polarized light here in this example here the electric and magnetic field they are labeled as red and blue and you can see that they are vibrating in perpendicular to each other and in one direction so the important thing about linearly polarized light is that its magnitude varies but the direction of vibration remains constant Now in contrast to linearly polarized light, we have circularly polarized light which is actually used for circular dichroism. In circularly polarized light, we have constant magnitude so see how it is different from linear polarized light. Here is the changing magnitude, here is constant magnitude but that direction is variable so there is a variation in direction actually the direction is such that the two fields they are one upon four lambda out of phase with each other so they are rapidly rotating and they are kind of making this oscillating magnetic field which is rotating so here is a nice animation of linear as well as circularly polarized light. I think that will illustrate my point even further. Okay, so here is the linearly polarized light. You can see that it is vibrating back and forth. So its magnitude is varying, but the direction is constant. So this is linear polarized light. And here is the circularly polarized light. Now here you can see that it is making a twist around the imaginary axis because the both the fields which are labeled here as red and green they are out of sync with each other about quarter of a wavelength and that's why it makes this twist and that's what a circularly polarized light is now this is what is the foundational principle of circular dichroism let's come to that now here is the optical rotation I am sure you must have read about it in 
previous discussions of biochemistry so what is optical rotation optical rotation is a phenomenon which is shown by chiral molecules these are molecules which have carbon atoms which are joined to four different groups so even linearly polarized light can be considered the sum of two circularly polarized lights of opposite signs so this is the sum total linearly polarized light incident light and it can be considered a sum of two circularly polarized light which are vibrating but they are of different signs now when we expose it to some optically active substance which is a chiral substance that means it has two forms which cannot be superimposed on one another just like our left and right hands it will rotate the light by a specific degree and that is called the specific rotation now it really depends on the substance whether it rotates the left light or the right light by that degree but there is some difference between how it treats the left uh, light as well as the right light and these are both circularly polarized lights and this leads to formation of elliptically polarized light because of the difference between the rotation so here we have the overall schematic we have the optically active substance here let's say this is substance a we have elliptically polarized light on the left elliptically polarized right light these are the incident lights so you can see the sizes of the circles are the same so these are of uh, same magnitude but when the light comes out so because of how it interacts with that circularly polarized light either on the left or the right in this case for example there is more absorption of the right circularly polarized light as compared to the left circularly polarized light and this leads to formation of this elliptically polarized light so there is a difference in the absorption and this difference which is called delta a it's basically a, a, a absorption on the left minus absorption of the right this is what is measured by circular dichroism and this is expressed in the unit ellipticity which is usually having the units of centimeter square per gram or centimeter square per decimo so this is the overall basis of circular dichroism now i would like to emphasize that these differences are tiny tiny very tiny usually the differences are on the order of 10 milli degrees for example so we have to be absolutely sure about the difference that we are uh, observing and this instrument itself the circular dichroism spectrometer they are usually very susceptible to any kind of noise so it's very important to have clean cuvettes and to have buffers which absorb very little so very low amounts of salts are usually used in the buffers to minimize this noise because the signal to background ratio is not that is not that much now here is an example of how we can use it to characterize proteins so on this diagram we have wavelength in nanometer so we are going from 190 nanometer all the way to 250 nanometer this is called the far uv spectrum and when we look at the ellipticity which is denoted by theta here in degree and centimeter square per decimal we can see that proteins having different secondary structures show different kinds of absorption spectra so for example we have this black line this shows the spectrum of an alpha helix similarly the red one shows anti parallel beta sheet the green one is the disordered random coil and blue and light blue they are of collagen triple helix as well as denatured collagen respectively so if we compare our protein of interest with these spectra these are called fasman standard spectra 
and if we use mathematical functions to see how well our protein fits these spectra we can gauge or we can estimate the amount of secondary structure for example whether our protein is 80% alpha helix and 20% beta sheet or 70% alpha helix 20% beta sheet and 10% random coil so these kind of estimates can be very easily made if we have clean data and if we can compare it very clearly using phasmin standard spectra now what kind of uh, molecules they show absorbance in proteins what are the different chromophores so mains are let me just get from my notes so we have the peptide bonds peptide bonds absorb less than or equal to 240 nanometer then we have aromatic amino acids so these are phenylalanine, tryptophan and tyrosine. These absorb at 260 to 320 nanometer. By the way, this is called near UV range. We also have disulfide bonds. These absorb at around 260 nanometer. And there are also absorption spectra for different cofactors. For example, we have pyridoxal phosphate, PLP, very important for amino acid metabolism. At 330 nanometer, it shows strong absorbance. Flavin molecules, for example, FAD, FADH2, they show absorbance at 300 to 500 nanometer. And heme molecules, they show absorbance at 410 nanometer. So these are some basic chromophores present in different proteins that we need to be aware about. So this is one of the instruments. This is how the circular dichroism looks like. This is by the company JASCO, a Japanese company, in which made the first circular dichroism spectropolarimeter or spectrophotometer. And similar as well as advanced versions of this equipment are available from JASCO as well as other vendors. Now the setup of any spectrophotometer, any CD spectrophotometer is basically like this. So we have light source, usually a xenon lamp or helium argon lamp is used. It emits unpolarized light, just like I said, any typical light source will emit unpolarized light. Then we use monochromators to have linearly polarized light. Then we have what is known as PEM or photoelectric modulator. Now this will create our two versions of circularly polarized light, right and left circularly polarized light. And these will hit the sample and based on how the sample interacts with these two lights we will get different signals and those differences basically what are what we are interested in measuring and these will be detected by photomultiplier tubes which will amplify the signal and give us a digital readout now coming to the applications of circular dichroism so the first and foremost application of circular dichroism is in knowing about the secondary structure composition of proteins. So as I already described to you, we can compare our protein of interest with the standard phasmin spectra and see what kind of secondary structure composition is present in our protein of interest. This is a very preliminary step in going for further X-ray diffraction data as well as NMR data. So this is a very good preliminary step uh, before doing these you know, detailed analyses. So getting an idea of what kind of secondary, secondary structures are present in our protein is very helpful and this can be obtained from CD spectroscopy. Then we have the tertiary structure fingerprint. So apart from the secondary structure which is just the alpha helix beta sheet random coil the local structures we can also get some idea about the overall tertiary structure of the protein and this can be investigated using measurements at both the far as well as the near UV spectra. 
So here is, for example, 190 to 260. This is the far UV. And this is for a protein of interest. This is from a previously published study. And you can see the wild type and the mutant forms here. Uh, they are almost the same. You cannot even make out where the two lines are. Actually, there is a solid line and there is a dotted line, but you can see that they are almost the same. And here we have the near UV spectrum from 260 to 320 nanometer. And you can see here also the structure is almost the same. But the surprising thing is the, the mutant form, which is shown in this dotted line, it is inactive. Now normally this information would be useful, but here using CD spectroscopy, we can additionally know that the loss of activity is not due to loss of tertiary structure because we are getting the same uh, tertiary structure fingerprint here using CD spectroscopy. So the loss of activity is due to something else or maybe due to some subtle changes and not dramatic changes in tertiary structure. We can also get idea about integrity of the cofactor binding sites as well as the estimation of protein structural stability using CD spectroscopy. Uh, the cofactors, for example, pyridoxal phosphate and hemes, they usually don't show much absorbance when they are present as free molecules in solution, but they, when they are bound to the protein, they show a very significant increase in absorbance. So this can be measured using CD spectroscopy. Also estimation of protein structural stability can be made by CD spectroscopy. So here we have an example of two different forms of protein. Here we have a protein which was the intact protein and then on the other hand we have the dotted line which is the recombinant protein which is made up of two parts joined together so we are reconstituting the protein using the recombinant parts so we express one protein fragment of the intact protein express it purify it and then express the other part and then reconstitute the intact protein and here we can see in the spectrum which is very larger than the uv spectrum we have the cd spectrum of this uh, in the far uv spectrum we don't see much difference but in the higher wavelengths we can see that there is actually a dramatic shift here in the wild type and the mutant form and this is due to binding of the cofactor. So the mutant protein shows a different absorption fingerprint as compared to the wild type form. So it gives us an idea about whether the cofactor binding site is disturbed and how structural stability is affected uh, with these intact and recombinant proteins. And also we can have detection of conformational changes in protein. So this is usually done by monitoring the CD spectrum of a protein with increasing temperature. Usually this will denature the protein in a stepwise manner and then we can follow the degradation of structural stability of the protein. So here we can see a protein in the far UV as well as the near UV ranges. In the near UV range we see some deterioration of the signal especially around here and this leads us to a information about where the particular conformational changes in proteins are occurring. So the last point is studies on protein folding. So numerous studies on CD spectroscopy using small peptides as well as larger peptides have been carried out. So for example, here we have two different forms of the protein and we are following their folding. So this leads to an idea about their folding constant, their rate constants of formation of a folded protein. And this also lend support to the hypothesis of the molten globule, which is the state that large proteins undergo before they fold. But this uh, molten globule state has not been observed using CD spectroscopy for smaller peptides, maybe hinting that the smaller peptides do not undergo that phase. Okay. So this was my discussion of CD spectroscopy. I hope you liked the information, although it is a little bit physics and chemistry heavy, but I hope I, I was clear about the concepts. If you have some doubts or questions, please let, let me know in the comments below. As usual, please give the video a thumbs up if you like the video and please subscribe to my channel. Uh, till the next time we meet, take care and bye-bye.